Hello and welcome. It's time for Bangable Insights. I'm Godfrey Mutiswa. Now, digitization is a key to the global banking agenda to bridge the gap between traditional banking and the demands of the digital generation of consumers, especially today as we look specifically at how Standard Chartered Bank uh, in Kenya is prioritizing digital services and products to transition clients to digital banking during and post COVID-19. For this conversation, I'm joined by Karyuki Ngari, CEO of Standard Chartered Kenya and East Africa, as well as acting head of retail banking, Africa and the Middle East. Thanks for joining us uh, very much uh, today. Uh, you're wearing two big hats there, uh, Karyuki, if I may say so, and it will be interesting i imagine to get the experiences of uh, people in the regions that you serve but let's perhaps start by talking about the requirements for uh, the migration to these new forms of banking from the old forms of banking as we know it thank you very much i think uh, let me let me start by explaining how we how we got here I think it was quite evident to other standard chartered that uh, digitization is going to play a big role in the future of banking. And so one of our key priorities that, uh, that we rolled out was transforming and disrupting the digital. And how do you use digitization to transform not only the culture within the organization, but also how do you, how do you use digitization to change the way clients interact with yourself, with the bank, and how they, they conduct their business with the bank. So that was one of our priorities and we've worked very hard uh, to make sure that we've enabled that and we've cut it into different pillars the first pillar is for the retail banking client for the retail banking client most of your banking all your banking is on the telephone uh, on the on, on your mobile phones so any new offering the services and we've got over 70 services today you can do that on your on your mobile phone when it comes to opening an account you can do that on your on your mobile phone when you've got wealth investments, like uh, whether it's you want to buy a mutual fund or a bond, or you want to invest, then you can do that on your on your mobile phone. So that was very deliberate because that's that's how retail clients operate. They're always in your phone. So we moved away from a banking is where you went to be, where a banking is what you you chose to do it depending on your time. All you needed was Wi-Fi or bundles, and yeah. that worked quite well for clients. For the corporate clients, it's desktop. And that's what we call straight to bank. And so we invested heavily there for the corporate clients so that they can be able to do all their banking using the straight to bank platform from the comfort of their office, from whatever part of the world they are in. So it was very clear uh, two, two track investment for the corporate client, mainly desktop based, the straight to bank platform we call it. And for the retail client, it's a mobile phone uh, to do the banking on. Yeah. Before we talk about how COVID is disrupting this, in a sense, of course, what you were asking your clients to do was to ditch what they had done for decades, for years, in, in the case of uh, some of your clients. How difficult did you find it to persuade them to transition from uh, walking into the branch to saying, do everything you can? As you say, now you are sitting around 70% on your phone. I think it was not as difficult because clients had already started doing using a lot, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot on their phone. If you think about in in the Kenyan market, for instance, uh, Kenyans are very used to M-Pesa, so moving away from using the physical cash to actually making payments use via M-Pesa platform. So they were very comfortable already using the technology. When you think about uh, the days of introducing ATMs, uh, cash deposit machines, people are very comfortable. Now it was move and say uh, instead of going to the branch to do whatever services. We are actually now putting those services on the phone. For instance, activating your debit card. Yeah. Before, if you ever got a credit card or a debit card, we sent to you a PIN mailer on on uh, on, uh, on post office. You got the PIN mailer, and we had sent a little PIN there. So then you use the PIN to activate it, and then we move to the next stage where we started. You got the your card, and then you had to call our contact center. And now the final stage was now you don't do, need to do all that. You actually activate it through the online platform. So the clients are already ready. Uh, people are ready to do that. And yeah. so what we did was facility. That was what's very important. That's what has made a big difference. Yeah. And in terms of that take up, did you find any differences between what happened in Kenya and what you saw uh, in terms of practice in the rest of uh, the East African region? You'll find slight variations. Uh, yeah. You'll definitely find the slight variations in terms of the... Uh, as I mentioned, Kenya, because of M-Pesa, the uptick is quite quick when you tell people you can do all your, all your payments from here, or you can move your money from your account to mobile wallet. 
that was quite easy because uh, MPESA is ubiquitous in this market. When you go to other markets like Tanzania, probably it's a little slower, but not much different in terms of the timeline. People are moving as you and as you enable it. People quickly shift into that platform very, very quickly. People are able to take it. But what is important, you have to help the customers. You have to guide them and you have to assure them on their security because yeah. that's a nothing that they've got. So that's an area that we also have to invest in. You've got to unhold and then you've got to reassure them and make it easy for them to use. Yeah. Now you gave me uh, statistics in terms of tech up on the retail side. I wanted to know the stats as well on the wealth investment as well as the corporate size in terms of tech up uh, of these digital channels that you're introducing. Actually, today for our wealth products, about 60%, 60% of our all wealth offering is done via digital. People are doing that themselves and they're using the mobile phone. It, it has really moved up very, very quickly. And also because we made a deliberate decision for wealth, any new offering, so whether it's, for instance, some of the latest products we've rolled out, like the funeral cover, yeah. all those are done digitally. Whether it's purchasing with car insurance or travel insurance, all that is done digitally. So that has really led to a very fast uptick. We are no longer asking to fill piles and piles of paper or forms, like you know how insurance works. So we are very, that has, that has speeded up the uptick. For the corporate yeah. clients as well, it's, been very, it's in excess of 90%. When you look at uh, CAB clients, some are at 98%. They do everything digitally some will be 90 but the number is about 90 percent uh, that which is which is which is quite which is quite good and during this covid situation we've had to work very hard with a few clients who are having challenges to help them migrate because then once you've migrated there some of the offerings that we've given you there they really make a difference to how you 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 work with you work with the platform how you engage the platform for instance tax payments we are making 20 percent of the tax payments are done through through standard charter and sure. that is because of the implementing the technology that we've enabled that you can pay your taxes 24 7. So you don't have to worry about what time is the branch closing it's at your convenience you go in there do the transfers and then it happens so we've seen very good uptake and we are very encouraged by how it's going on so far very very interesting statistics because i'm trying to think and link them to the rest of the continent i can see big gaps uh, if so for instance if you look at west africa and you also look at uh, here in uh, uh, southern africa but i'm interested in the statistics on wealth investment and the slow take up because these are moneyed people right but it reminds me as well of a friend of mine who used to say to me you know godfrey when i go to the bank I don't go at the time that my banker has said I come and I make him wait to make sure he understands who's paying the money. I wonder if that's a reflection of that. Are you finding any sort of resistance by some to go digital? I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call it resistance to be fair to be. I think it's a, it's something new, it's a new offering so people you find some uh, reassurance what people want is that hand holding. When it comes to matters of money, people become a little sensitive. You don't want, sometimes you feel, oh, if I'm doing all my investment on phone, what if I make a mistake? <laughs> what happens? But in terms of reassuring the people that sometimes, at the first time you may, you may need to add hold, this is what you do, open the app, go to this line, this is, we guide you the steps. Then after that, people are, people are really excited. They don't want to come back to us again. They can be able to do that. So yeah. I find once you assure them, once you take them through, and that also cuts for the corporate clients as well. You'll find some who are reluctant to do it. Uh, they feel that, no, I'm used to signing checks all my life. I go to the office at a certain time, yeah. give me a checkbook, and I sign checks, and then the bank calls me to confirm. So all, it's, it's, it's as we call it, it's unlearning what you've always learned and say, this is a new way of doing things. It's yeah. like uh, it, when the automatic cars came to this part of the world, there are people who still ordered the, the gear shift, and they felt that uh, an automatic <laughs> car was not... But once, once you get used to it, you run along with it and you discover you can't go back to the shift when you had to use engage the clutch. Not many of us can remember how to drive like that anymore. <laughs> Interesting, use that example. I'm sure you're looking at my head and thinking you must have been one of those that struggled with the movement from manual to automatic. I certainly did because I thought, you know, we used to say to ourselves, when you want to really drive, you have to fill the gear and, you know, push it as, well, as much as you want <laughs> before you change it. Right. Let's talk about COVID and what it has done. I don't know the extent to which it has disrupted things in East Africa. I mean, I watch from afar, but here in Southern Africa, it's certainly been drastic. I want to know, in terms of your strategy and the disruption that has come through from uh, this pandemic, how difficult has that been? 
Well, it's been quite uh, devastating. I think when you look at uh, what has happened, especially when the first case was uh, announced in the middle of March if, in Kenya, uh, immediately after that, the government went into announce a lockdown and uh, uh, there was coffee imposed between seven and five. Uh, that was very disruptive. Everybody, the, the amount of information was not always available. So the, um, April was really tough for not only ourselves, but the businesses as well, very disruptive. So this was unprecedented. Uh, think about it we, we have a bcp but our bcp that's a business continuity plan is predicated on a single event so maybe you take care of what will happen if something happens in a certain building but when it's a health crisis you are everywhere so we had to really go back to the drawing board and say so what do we do how do we protect our staff how do we make sure that our staff are safe how do we enable them to work from home and then after that once our staff are secure how do we take care of our clients because they'll have to continue with their business so we had to go through that protect our staff, and then also take care of our clients as well, especially those ones who had facilities. So it was, this was devastating. I think uh, April was, uh, was, a, was a tough month all around. And then uh, we started seeing a sort of recovery in May, and then we've seen the government starting to ease up. The, the curfew was extended. The lockdown in the counties was relaxed. That time you couldn't leave Nairobi. Nairobi was completely locked. Uh, some four counties, you couldn't travel in or out. So that, was, that has been relaxed now. But unfortunately, we're still seeing the number of cases uh, going, trending upwards. And also, unfortunately, the number of deaths also increasing. So it's also an, another different area that, yes, the country is opening up. Mm. Yes, but uh, how do we help the businesses? How do we cope with, in, the new, in the new world that we are living in, where we are having more positive cases, and, but people still want to go with the business? I think the interruption has been total. Yeah. And this is when technology has come to be quite real, because... Yeah. Some, the businesses that are transitioned to technology have been able to write this a lot better than the ones who are who relied purely on physical engagement. I think yeah. it's made a big difference. I've seen reports suggesting that uh, this pandemic, uh, what it has done is to accelerate the development of technology and the adoption of some of the technologies that we're talking about now. And also just in terms of how we are changing the way we work and how our offices of the future are going to look like. Is that something that you share that you have had to do as a bank to try to make sure that you adapt as quickly as possible to ensure, one, you don't lose your customers, two, you are able to service them, and then three, that you're actually able uh, to migrate all your customers to this new way of thinking and adjusting? Definitely. I think one of the biggest transformations we've seen here at Standard Chartered is clearly the working from home. Uh, we used to talk about it as a concept. We used to encourage as a bank. Uh, we'd encourage people to work from home. Uh, and then there will be always be resistance. But now when you look at it, when you look at 70% uh, of our colleagues are working from home, it tells you that when you did a recent survey and most of the people are saying, I'm not coming back. I mean, most people are saying, if I ever want to come back once a week, I'm like, oops, this is different. <laughs> we, are, we are trying to argue that you don't need a desk. You need to have a working area. But when we look at our own statistics, 70% of colleagues and working comfortably from home is making a difference. And that is also going with our clients as well. The clients, our clients have also seen that actually you can do a lot more meetings. You do not need to travel through the Nairobi jam or through the traffic jams to attend a meeting. You can use Zoom to do that or Blue Jeans to engage in the meetings. It's going to change the way we work. Definitely, there, there are things that will completely change uh, in terms of travel, in terms of insisting working from, a, a, from an office. I think the capabilities that we've enabled today for colleagues to be able to work from home will continue. So that people will be able to work from home comfortably. And they, also the other area that we also now have to look at it is how do we make sure that customer's data is protected that remains our priority because mm. it's, it's very very important so mm. it has changed the way we look at things some things that could have taken for forever like you said uh, it looked like it was looking like something will happen many many years to come now we've been able to fast clearly that the world of work is going to be completely transformed yeah is it more efficient yes it is it will be definitely more efficient i mean today i'm, uh, I'm i can i can have three three four client calls in a day that would have been impossible in the past because by the time you move from one client meeting to another in your premises so they come to see you, the yeah. traffic jam alone make, uh, made sure that that couldn't happen. You could only do probably one or two meet, meetings. So it's a lot more efficient in terms of how you are how you're interacting. Uh, it, it is definitely a lot more efficient.
Yeah, I was going to say this must have been heaven sent for you from two perspectives. Number one, the traffic jams that you are talking about. I'm uh, uh, very much uh, uh, aware of those and I have suffered uh, some of the worst of them uh, in traveling between, say, for instance, the airport and uh, getting into the CBD and also just getting away from the office to home. And then the second part is the advantage, of course, that you had in Kenya because of M-Pesa and the uptake of uh, uh, digital uh, products uh, before that. To what extent has that helped the business uh, perhaps not so much as uh, perhaps not lose money, but perhaps be in a better position than it was before uh, COVID-19 hit? <clears throat> definitely being very clear in terms of our strategy, transforming and disrupting the digital definitely helped. If you look at our full year results last year, our costs were up 6-7%, and that was primarily based on technology investment. So it's something that the bank, we are already ahead in terms of the investing and enable, enablement. What COVID did was accelerated the migration. It made it quite clear that the migration, we, the strategy was right. How do you accelerate it? That's what, that, is what, that, was, that was what made the difference. I think in terms of we were not doing everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. So we were able to quickly adapt and do the enablement and then help clients migrate as well. And then also it helped that the clients, because of what they had gone through, and also because a lot of clients also didn't want to start, they wanted to stop going to the office or to the bank. They needed, they felt, yeah, let me sign up this technology. Then you don't have to be physically there for meeting. So it has definitely helped. But, uh, but it's important that for us, very clear strategy that we are executing, that helped us accelerate the move that we are doing. Yeah. Did you have to spend more in, in terms of uh, executing that strategy because of the arrival of COVID-19 or you stuck within uh, the perimeters of uh, the, the capex that you plan to spend all along on uh, moving the bank along? We had to spend more, especially in terms of enabling colleagues to work from home. Right? When you think right. about our staff, not all of them had laptops. Uh, laptops were a preserve of a few seniors, but now everybody who needed to who needed to work from home, we had to provide them with laptops. We had to provide them with VPNs, those are virtual private networks, to make sure that the, the security is is, uh, is enabled. Uh, our dealers, uh, who you always use for the dealing room, for them to be able to continue working from home, this special technology also we had to invest in, mm -hmm. and also to enable the bundles or the Wi-Fi to help the connectivity. So a big spend was on enabling staff work from home so that is where the bigger the bigger spend went but in terms of the other projects those were already on train and it was a question of for instance when you think about opening accounts you could already do it through our app so the, it, that was already enabled so it was yeah. just now a question of get a lot more of our clients to open accounts through the app but the bigger portion of the money that we spent especially between march and may was really to enable colleagues to be able to work from home comfortably and securely yeah. Yeah, you, you, you referred to it earlier, the need, the need to make sure that obviously that you're able to do all these things uh, safely. We live, of course, in the age of big data where uh, you guys are custodians to our information and we're all very wary how much am I at the bank should know about me and all the other things that are come along with it. How are you mitigating uh, those very, very real concerns? That's one side of the question. The second side of the question is how That's are you leveraging? That's something that we take very seriously. Yeah, I was going to add a little side to that, but you answer that because you have clearly had the first part of my question. I think it's, it's very, very important. And that's part of the area that our investment in type of cyber security is, is as a bank will increase, will increase multiple times. Because we are, we are very conscious now that there's a lot of things happening. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, is digital. So if you look at our investment in cyber technology, it's is, is huge now. And we're spending there and, and, and not taking any shortcuts. If you look internally, for instance, uh, the bank, we use Blue Jeans, uh, that technology for our, for our virtual meetings and all for our ongoing engagement. There's a reason, there's a reason why we went for, with, with that platform. So in terms of, and then the data security, making sure it is safe, investing in the latest tools that that is important to protect the customer data because we know we have an obligation i think uh, in terms of not only because of the regulatory where the data protection laws have come into into place like kenya but also because we owe it to our clients to make sure that their data is safe and uh, whatever information they are giving to us is safeguarded that is very very important and will always remain a priority for us yeah um in terms of uh, dealing with your customers I'm, I'm sure when you, when COVID-19 arrived, there was a hit in terms of uh, the volume of transactions. Where are you sitting at now? Now we are sort of settling in some kind of a normality. We are starting to see uh, 
the every month is better than the previous month. I think that the last month, the lowest month was April. Across all, it didn't, across all sectors, whether it's from our retail clients, our SMEs or our corporate, April was, uh, well, I would say it was the bottom. And then May, we started seeing the business start to pick up. June was better than May. July was much better than June. But I wouldn't call it normal yet. I think uh, we also, we have to remember that, for instance, in Kenya, uh, bars, there's still a curfew at 9 p.m. So sure. businesses are separated at night whether it was uh, bars, for instance, are still closed. So social gatherings are still not, uh, are still not happening. So it's, it's, we are, I think we are quite far from normal. But July is definitely better than how April was. So we are seeing month on month is an uptick. And hopefully this, this will translate. Is, uh, we, as a bank, we, we are reflect of the wider, com- or the wider economy. When the rest of the economy opens up, we are there to support the wider economy. Absolutely, and it's certainly better in your case because I don't think you went as drastic as some of the measures that we saw here in uh, South Africa, and I won't bore you uh, too much with that. I'm sure you would have read them and said, Phew, I'm in Nairobi, I'm better off here than being in Johannesburg at the moment. Let's talk about uh, uh, this new normal that's emerging for your workforce. 70% you said have uh, been able to work from home. What do you do with the other 30% that is unable to work from home? And then secondly, in terms of trying to extrapolate and understand people's attitudes going into the future, where do you see that ratio sitting at? I think the, the people who, uh, for instance, for us, the people who are who are working from the offices is uh, especially the contact centers. That's, that's what we call the contact center because they require a uh, very specialized equipment to be able to receive the calls and to be able to answer the queries. So that's the only; those are the only uh, colleagues who are really coming to the office. And what we've also done with them. Is location they are not in one in one location but any other any other any other role can be done outside out, outside of the office so that's so it was a question of must you do you need the can the equipment be available to you at home you just need a laptop or what else do you need if you require specialized equipment like our contact centers do to be able to go through and uh, any customer calls because customers can call for with any query they're able to handle it i think the future is going to be hybrid i I think people have seen that, uh, and this is, we did a survey last month. People have seen, for instance, uh, I don't need to spend one hour in the traffic jam. I don't need to wake up at five so that I'm ready by six and then get into my, my own car or my transport to get to the office by eight. I can actually be able to work from home. So I think you will start seeing a hybrid where probably, because intimacy is also important. That's what social, uh, we are all social beings. You know, you know for, for people who know each other, I guess it's quite easy. But if you don't know each other, if you've got a new colleague who has joined you, you can't, you can't really create rapport. If you've never met face to face. So I see situations where people will probably be coming to the work, to the off physical office once a week or twice a month, uh, different days. But yeah. mostly they'll say, let me continue, let me work from home. I'm just as productive. Or let me do my morning meetings in the office from, uh, from uh, whichever medium I'm using, whether it's blue jeans or Zoom. And then in the afternoon, if there's any need for a meeting, or if a customer sees that they insist on a physical meeting, that, that will happen. Yeah. You, I think it's going to be a different world. It's going to be a completely different world. Absolutely. And one of the things that COVID-19 is demanding from, uh, from us, of course, is that these are the new buzzwords. So we hear about t- agility, we hear about pivoting and all those other things. But one word that is not going away from the old world into this new world, if I may call it, is innovation. You obviously have to make sure that you keep innovating. So my question to you is, has COVID-19 enabled you to produce new products that are suitable for this type of environment? Yes, it has. I think innovation is something that you have to keep doing. <clears throat> Definitely in our world. Uh, when, you look at, uh, when you look at, for instance, what fintechs have been able to do, the, the challenges, so we moved away from competing with them to partnering with them. So in terms of partnerships, that is something that we've been able to do. So some of the partnerships we've gone into today with some of the, when you look at whether it's in, in, in matters of water uh, or in matters of uh, how we can help uh, governments be able to collect money in terms of, we call it, is a project we are, we, we are doing uh, to help in smart metering mm-hmm. through our SC vectors, which, was a, which is a vehicle we created to help in innovation. That is just to speed up this, uh, the innovation so that as a bank, we are able to help to bring in different clients. How do we connect them with fintechs? And how do we partner? And do we do, how do we solve their problems, especially when it comes to, to money collections? So when it comes to innovation, 
it is an area that we are going to go to uh, a lot more. Uh, when clients talk to us, one of the areas they say they prioritize for us is matters of health. So how do we partner with health partners, uh, with people who provide health facilities or, uh, or partnerships or solutions, and they've been able to really work well in, in terms of uh, what we can offer the client. Yeah. So what what COVID has taught us during this time is you can't do everything yourself, but you yeah. can get the right part. And once you've got the right partners, you'll have the right solution for clients. Yeah. One of the things that we saw here in South Africa in 2019 and then in 2020, we saw it in operation is uh, the arrival of the digital only uh, bank. And we made a lot of noise. I'm sure you'd have seen about Discovery Bank and all that. But you appear to have been running already because you're already in nine countries. Talk to me a little bit about what you do in those nine countries in terms of your uh, digital only bank and the kind of benefits that it offers. Yes, I think two, two, 18 months ago, we rolled out the, what you call the... 18 the digital, months. 18 months ago, yes, CDI. So we started rolling out in different parts of the world, in different markets in Africa. We are in, in the nine retail markets that we operate in Africa, uh, markets in West Africa, <clears throat> East Africa, and Southern Africa. Uh, in Southern Africa, in Botswana, Zimbabwe, and uh, Zambia. East Africa, we're in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. And West Africa, we're in Ghana, Nigeria. Uh, Sierra Leone and the Gambia and the uh, CDI Cote d'Ivoire itself. Those are the markets where we rolled out this this platform, and it was it was it was a way to make sure that clients who want to once you download the app, you can open an account with us. And what we've seen for us, what we have really seen is it has completely changed the way clients engage with us. A uh, number of clients who want to bank with us, three uh, in terms of new clients who are opening accounts with us is more in multiples of three in each and every one of those markets. So because it becomes easy, it doesn't matter where you are. Once you've downloaded, you can open an account with that. So this is really making a big difference. So in terms of having being digital first, and then on top of that, of being able to open an account, then you're able to bring services on top. So the complete our digital banks becomes real. That it's not only for new accounts that you want to that you like to open, but also the services that you want to do, you can do it digitally. So yeah. you really have no reason to visit a branch, and that's what is going to make a difference. And that's a platform that you're going to continue introducing. And growing as we move as we move forward. When we put lending products there, we've already got savings products in there. We've got yeah. wealth products. It becomes a full bank that you yeah. can be able to do digitally. You don't have yeah. to do that physically. At all. Yeah. Very quickly, were you? Did you see any differences in terms of take up in age profile and in geography? <clears throat> the only difference is the number of take ups. I mean, it's just exponential in terms of sure. the people working that bread. Every market is the same. I think you can see that uh, there's a generation that want to engage, but they want to engage very, very differently. The millennials clearly uh, very want to engage the bank very, very differently from the, the baby boomers or older generation. And we've seen a big uptick of the younger generation, which is which works well for the bank because it made it basically means the bank has a secure future when you get the younger generation coming in and then make sure that we can be able to solve for them in, in, in the platform. You it's been a great success for us. You can count me in amongst the young generation because I'm digitally savvy too. Don't look down on me, Karyuki. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Karyuki yeah. Ngari, thank you. Karyuki Ngari is the CEO of Standard Chartered Kenya and East Africa. Absolutely fascinating when you think about it. I mean, we had made a lot of noise here in South Africa about Recovery Bank last year. And in 2018, Ivory Coast already had a digital only bank. Thanks uh, for joining us uh, for this conversation. Just to remind you again, he is the CEO of Standard Chartered Kenya and East Africa. He's also acting head of Retail Banking Africa and Middle East at Standard Chartered. And that's our banking insights for this time. Thank you uh, for watching. Until next time, goodbye.